أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والعن أعداءهم My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the pivotal teachings of all divine revelations and of the religion of Islam is that a believer shouldn't feel depressed if their deeds are left unrecognized. If people are not grateful when you do something for the sake of Allah, precisely because you've done it for the sake of God, not for people to thank you or to show appreciation. In fact, this is a hallmark and a prime feature of a true believer. Listen to what the Holy Prophet says. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله أفضل الناس عند الله منزلة وأقربهم من الله وسيلة المحسن يكفر إحسانه The closest person in status in the eyes of Allah and the one who has the greatest proximity to God is a doer of good whose deeds are covered. يُكَفَّرُ إِحْسَانُ In fact, if you think about it, people fail to appreciate and to be grateful for the blessings and bounties of the creator of the universe himself, let alone his good servants. We have traditions in which the Imams, there is one in particular attributed to Imam Sadiq who quotes his grandfather Amir al muminin where he says, Al Mu'minu Mukaffar. A true believer is one whose good deeds are covered, they're concealed, they're not exposed, they are left unrecognized. Whereas a disbeliever is one who receives fame and recognition. Fame is a hallmark of disbelievers. Whereas the true servants of God are people who are ambiguous, people who are not recognized. And so we shouldn't be surprised if that is the case when the great virtues of Abu Talib, the uncle of the Holy Messenger of God, his protector, his guardian, the one without whose protection the religion of Islam would have become extinct before it had a chance to prosper. Don't be surprised that his virtues, that his great attributes are not recognized. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised, brothers and sisters, when this great personality is accused of idolatry and disbelief. He's the one whose contributions gave rise to the religion of Islam. And yet he's accused of disbelieving in the religion of Islam. God forbid one of us so much as criticizes their idols and the so-called companions. God forbid you ever say something that is interpreted as being a word of slander. God forbid you say something about them that is even remotely negative. Rivers of blood are shed because the Shia are accused of being antagonistic towards a certain group, a squad among the companions of Rasulullah. Thousands upon thousands 
of Shia are murdered, slaughtered, men, women and children because of the mere accusation that they don't like some of the companions, some of the people who surrounded the Prophet. The hypocrites that the Quran openly speaks about. And yet when it comes to the Prophet's own uncle, the Prophet's protector and guardian, Abu Talib is not just criticized, he is given the most vile title that anyone could be given. He is accused of the greatest crime of all, the crime of idolatry, the crime of disbelief. That is okay. There's no problem there. You can casually sit down and cast out the Prophet's own family members. Who's the closest person to an individual? Isn't it their mother? Isn't it their father? Isn't it their uncle? Isn't it the person who protected them, guarded them, looked after them, raised them as orphans? These very same individuals, the Prophet's father, mother, grandfather, uncle, are all accused of being idolaters. But God forbid a Shia ever utter a word that's misconstrued as something remotely negative about any of the companions. But, as I said, we shouldn't be surprised. Because that is almost one of the traditions in this life. This entire lowly world of ours is a place where the good are not rewarded, the wicked are greatly amplified and given fame and respect and adoration and idolized, but the good are cast out. Listen to this hadith. This is in the Blessed Book of Al-Kafi. And the reason I'm sharing these hadith with you is because I think it's been, what, 14 centuries? Over a thousand years where we have tried to make the case, the very solid and strong case, to prove that Abu Talib was not just a believer, he was the master of believers. And we've tried and we've written books upon books and papers and provided all manner of evidence and proof, but it all falls on deaf ears because the Umayyad culture that surrounded this nation the bulk of the Muslim world has left them so scarred and damaged. The Umayyad ideology is so ingrained like a deadly parasite, a leech that latches on the collective brain of the nation and leaves no room for them to think outside of this dark Umayyad paradigm that was created over a thousand years ago. So we've done our best and we've fulfilled the proof, the burden of proof is no longer on our shoulders. However, we still have a massive responsibility and a great debt of gratitude that we owe to Abu Talib. May God's everlasting peace and blessings be upon him. And so we will never cease to defend him. We shall never stop to praise him. Because that is a debt that we owe to Abu Talib And so I will share some points, some of which are probably things you haven't heard, not uh, as famous perhaps as some of the other pieces of evidence and discussions surrounding the great personality of Abu Talib, insha'Allah. The first hadith I'd like to share with you is in the blessed book of Al-Kafi. In volume one of Al-Kafi, Muhammad ibn Ya'qub al-Kulayni, may Allah be pleased with him, narrates 
the following hadith. I will cut out the chain of narrations. He traces the hadith back to uh, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. The Imam quotes his ancestors all the way to the Holy Prophet of God. And he says that in the beginning, when God was about to create the first thing in the universe, the Imam goes into detail about God creating a light extracted from his own light. مِن نُورِهِ الَّذِي نَوَّرَتْ مِنْهُ الْأَنْوَارِ The Imam then goes on to say that this light which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, the very first was that of Muhammad and Ali, the messenger of God and the commander of the faithful. He then took that light. فَلَمْ يَزَالَ نُورَيْنِ أَوَّلَيْنِ إِذْ لَا شَيْءَ he created these two lights. It was one light which he split into two. And then th these two lights were passed down after he created mankind. They were passed down. They were kept in their pristine and pure and unadulterated form. And they were passed down from one pure person to another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even alludes to this in the Holy Quran, which is yet another proof that the Prophet's ancestors were all believers. وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فَالْسَاجِدِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You were passed down from one prostrator to another prostrator, meaning those who prostrated before God, obviously. And so the lights were passed down from one pure man to another. <laughs> Until these two lights, which were attached to one another, eventually they were split. Where did the split happen? It was after Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, this great patriarch of Bani Hashim. And so the Imam says that these two lights after Abdul Muttalib were then split into what the Imam calls Fi Adhuri Tahirain. Into these two pure individuals. Fi Abdullah wa Abi Talib. Abdullah the father of the Holy Prophet, and Abu Talib, his brother, who was the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This, to us, is, is more than enough. There really is no need to engage in these rhetorical back and forth discussions like you're speaking to a brick wall. Not that we shouldn't do this, but my point is that as far as we're concerned, for our own belief, this is more than enough. When you're speaking to our opponents and our adversaries, people that have been filled with hatred and scorn and vitriol towards the family of the Prophet, there is no point. But for me, this is more than enough. As Sadiq min Ali Muhammad telling me that Abdullah and Abu Talib were two pure personalities who were entrusted with the lights of Muhammad and Ali. Because ultimately, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, what is the criteria for determining who is or isn't a believer? In other words, what's the litmus test for faith or lack thereof? Because by definition, faith can only be measured through what? Through action, because faith itself can only be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't know how much a person has faith or lacks faith. You'll never really know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah al But there is a litmus test. 
that we can use to measure whether or not we have faith or whether or not someone else has faith in their heart. What is it? It's action. It's how that faith translates into their actions, into their deeds, or into their misdeeds. Look at how the Qur'an articulates this in the context of early Islam. This very concept that action is the product of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم والذين آمنوا وجاهدوا في سبيل الله والذين آووا ونصروا أولئك هم المؤمنون حقا لهم مغفرة ورزق كريم He says but those who have believed and emigrated and fought in the cause of Allah and listen carefully to this and those who gave shelter and aided it is they who are the believers truly they're the real believers. Allah then says, for them is forgiveness and noble provision. What does that mean? Listen to what Allah said earlier. وَالَّذِينَ آووا وَنَصَرُوا Meaning those that gave shelter and aided. Now, if you give shelter and provide aid to a normal Muslim, someone who is a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who is good, and you give them aid and shelter, Allah says that that is a sign of belief. Now what if you give aid and shelter to the Holy Messenger himself? What if you guard the Prophet from evil and from harm reaching him and help him and support him? every step of the way. What does that make you? According to this verse in the Quran, They are truly the believers. For them is forgiveness and noble provision. If this verse doesn't prove once and for all that Abu Talib, in fact, traditions tell us that this verse is about Abu Talib even though his, his name isn't mentioned there, but it doesn't need to be. It's obvious. If you ask anyone, I don't care about this, their sect or affiliation, who guarded the Prophet? Who was his guardian? Who was his custodian? Who was his protector? They'll all say Abu Talib. It's right there in the Quran. And so you can evaluate one's faith by examining their values and priorities. For example, those engrossed in material indulgence and illicit pleasures. They clearly don't care much for the afterlife, do they? Someone whose only concern is this dunya, this life, their desires, their temptations. What does that tell you about their priorities vis-a-vis -vis the afterlife? It tells you that they prioritize this life. They don't really believe. Maybe they believe in something. But for now, they lead a YOLO life. You only live once. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact says in Surah An-Nahl, He says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمُ اسْتَحَبُّ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى الْآخِرَةِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرِينَ Allah says those, the hypocrites, the disbelievers, they favor this life over the afterlife. And God does not guide those who hide the truth, those who disbelieve. So, based on how you prioritize, thing, prioritize different things, you and I can evaluate and measure their values and their priorities, their principles, what they really care about. Now let me ask you this. If you prioritize your friends over your family, if you spend more time with your friends than you do with your own family, with your own wife, if you sacrifice the time you're supposed to spend with your family in favor of your friends, what does that mean? It means that you favor your friends over your family. It's a no-brainer. 
You don't need a PhD or be a rocket scientist to understand that. Now, how many people do you know who would favor their nephews over their children? No one I know, at least, favors their nephews, their cousins, their friends over their own children. Why? Well, it's obvious because your children are your children. You care about them because they're yours. It's a little selfish, but that's the truth. Because they belong to you, you care more about them than other people. So if someone prioritizes and favors his nephews or cousins or friends over their family and their own children, what does that tell you? It tells you that there is a reason why they favor their nephews and cousins over their own children. Which is literally what Abu Talib السلام, did. You tell me. Abu Talib sacrifices his life, his children's life, his family's life in favor of the Holy Prophet. And yet after all of this, you tell me he didn't believe in him? He didn't believe in his mission? He didn't believe in his prophecy? How does that add up? How does that make sense? Even our opponents say that Abu Talib used to come to where the Prophet slept at night in Shab Abi Talib when they were under sanctions by the uh, idolaters. Abu Talib would come. He would lift up his nephew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He would go and hide him somewhere else in case the enemy's security apparatus and clandestine intelligence services had found the location where the Prophet slept, the tent where the Prophet would spend the night. Just in case they had found that information, he would remove the Prophet, take him somewhere else, and he would have one of his children go and sleep in his bed. Literally sacrificing his children for Rasulullah, for his own nephew. What does that tell you? And you still tell me that Abu Talib didn't believe that the Prophet was a messenger from God? مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ What is wrong with you as the Quran says? How do you judge? How do you judge? Put two and two together. Use a little brain. An iota of intelligence is all you need to tell you where Abu Talib's priorities lied. Sallallahu alayk, ya Abu Talib. Even Ibn Abi al-Hadid, who was a Sunni, he was a Mu'tazili. Ibn Abi al-Hadid speaks about, and, and by the way, this is like the discussion he, he has uh, on this point has nothing to do with Abu Talib or trying to somehow vindicate him or support him. He's talking about the pre-Islamic pagan era, the era of Jahiliyyah. And he says that during the Jahiliyyah, the people in Mecca were not a monolith. They were composed of a large, variegated, uh, and diverse group of people who live together, but they have very different views and beliefs. So he says there was a group, for example, that didn't believe in an afterlife, although they believed in God. There were others who didn't believe in God, but they believed in reincarnation. There was another group that believed in a god and an afterlife, but they worshiped the idols because they took the idols to be intermediaries between them and God. So you had all kinds of different groups. Then Ibn Abi al-Hadid says, listen carefully. He says, so the community 
that actually believed in God and the afterlife and in prophets and messengers and who followed the true religion of God was a very small one. And they were composed of Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, and Abdullah. He says Abu Talib was one of the true believers. The Sunni Mu'tazilite Ibn Abi Hadid says that. He speaks about Abu Talib in a different location in his commentary on Nahjul Balagha. And he has these this beautiful quartet in which he says, Walawla Abu Talib in Wabnuhu, Lama Mathul Din Shahsan Fakama. فَذَاكَ بِمَكَّةَ آوَى وَحَامَى وَهَذَا بِيَثْرِبَ جَسَّ الْحِمَامَ He says, had it not been for Abu Talib and his son, this religion would never have been personified and embodied and become strong. And then he says, the first one, meaning Abu Talib, protected and guarded the Prophet and helped and aided the Messenger in Mecca while his son helped the Prophet in Medina, in Yathrib, and went through the most intense tests and trials and tribulations for the sake of Islam. Ibn Abi al-Hadid says this. In fact, brothers and sisters, the faith of Abu Talib is so strong. It is such a hallmark of the personality of Abu Talib. That it became, listen carefully to this, it became the litmus test for the faith or lack thereof of everyone else. Let me try and say this in a different way. To reject the faith of Abu Talib is a sign of the rejection of God himself. This is a law that was codified and set by the highest authorities in the religion of Islam. This isn't coming from me. Let me share a few Examples here. After all of this, after all the sacrifices made by Abu Talib, after all the difficulties that Abu Talib went through, there are still people who insist that Abu Talib died as a disbeliever. They have this obsession with labeling Abu Talib as someone who was so arrogant that he, after all of this, he still couldn't get himself to believe that the messenger was sent from God. They have this insatiable, morbid desire to attack Abu Talib for no good reason, no logical reason whatsoever. Nothing that I could fathom or understand. That's why I use the word vitriol which is a deep-seated, ingrained hatred that you just can't explain. They still have the audacity to say this about Abu Talib, which is why the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt were absolutely explicit that if you so much... Let me actually share some of the hadiths. I don't need to paraphrase these Narrations, I'll just read them out to you and you can draw your own conclusions. Someone wrote to uh, Imam Ar-Ridha alayhi salatu wassalam. The actual person who wrote this uh, letter to the uh, Imam is a great personality. I don't want to mention his name. But judging from his track record and all of his contributions and achievements, 
if you put all of that together, you realize that the question he sent to the Imam was not because that he because he was having doubts, but rather he wanted clarification for other people to know, right? So he wrote this letter to Imam Rida alayhi salatu wasalam and he said to him, Arrifni ibn Rasulillah an al khabar al marwi anna aba talib fi dahdahin min nar yaghli min hudimaqah. This is the Umayyad tradition that I alluded to earlier, where they say that Abu Talib is in a pot of fire that is so hot and scorching that it makes his brain boil. He said to Imam Rida, our, our eighth Imam, tell me about this hadith. Is this true? Is this authentic? فَكَتَبَ إِلَيْهِ الرِّضَى عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ This hadith is in Uyun Akhbar al It's also narrated by Allah al Majlisi. In fact, all the references will be shared, inshaAllah, in this video. Imam al Rida wrote back to this individual. He said to him, very succinctly, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Amma ba'd, in shakakta fi imani abi talib. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. You should know that if you so much as doubt the faith of Abu Talib, kana masiruka ila nar your ultimate abode will be in the hellfire. So much as a doubt. Let me share a few more hadiths and then provide some context. Another person by the name of Aban ibn Mahmud wrote to Imam al-Rida alayhi salam and he said quite similarly, he said to him, Ju'iltu fidak, may my life be ransomed and sacrificed for you. Inni qad shakaktu fi islami Abi Talib. I... I'm beginning to have doubts about the faith of Abu Talib because, because of the onslaught, brothers and sisters. Because of this heavy, deadly bombardment by the opposing camp, by the enemies of, of the Prophet and his family. I'm having doubts. So the Imam wrote back to him. He said to him, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى He quoted a verse in the Quran. Said to him, whoever antagonizes and opposes the Prophet after things have become manifest for them, after guidance has now been made clear to them, and follows the path of other than believers, the disbelievers that is, he read the verse, Ha innaka illam tuqir bi imani abi talib. You should know that if you do not recognize, acknowledge the faith and belief of Abu Talib, kana masiruka ila nar. You will ultimately be thrown into the fires of hell. Hadith number three Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. This hadith is narrated by Allam al-Amini in his book Al-Ghadir, which if you can read Arabic or Farsi or Urdu, because it's available in all of those languages, if I'm not mistaken, I implore you to try and read the section where Allam al-Amini speaks about Abu Talib and his status and his position and his faith. Which in the Arabic um, version, this is in volume number seven. So... Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says to someone, he says to him, inna aba talib min rufaqa'in nabiyyin. What do they say about Abu Talib? He said they say that he was a disbeliever. He died without acknowledging God. He said, verily Abu Talib is a, fr- is, is a companion of the prophets. Again, he quoted this verse in the Quran. He said, Abu Talib is the one who accompanies the prophets, the messengers, the truthful ones, the martyrs, those who are good. And what better companionship, companionship one should have than these types and these groups of people? 
Let me mention one more hadith. Imam al-Sadiq السلام, said to one of his companions uh, known as uh, Muhammad ibn Yunus. The Imam said to him, Ya ibn Yunus or Ya Yunus, ma yaqulu nas fi Abi Talib? What do the people say about Abu Talib? An nas meaning the adversaries, right? The other camp. Qala ju'altu fidak, may my life be ransomed for you, I said to the Imam. يقولون هو في ضحضاح من نار. They say that he is burning in the smoldering fires of hell. وفي رجليه نعلان من نار. And he's wearing two shoes made of fire. تغلي منهما أم رأسه. The very top of his skull is boiling from those shoes. What did the Imam say in response? He said كذب أعداء الله. The enemies of God are liars. Inna Abu Talib min rufaqa in Nabiyyin. Verily, Abu Talib is among the companions of prophets, the truthful ones, the martyrs, the good ones. Wa hasuna ulaika, rafiqa. Also narrated in Bihar al Anwar. Now, remember I said earlier that because of his incredible faith and belief, and devotion to God. Believing in his belief became a litmus test for belief, right? Which is why when you look at people who have this obsession at attacking Abu Talib, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt have provided us with an incredibly powerful and lucid and potent tool for identifying and distinguishing the hypocrites from the true believers. In other words, Abu Talib is the litmus test. Ask them, what do you think about Abu Talib? Was he a believer or, an, or a disbeliever? Again, this is something that applies to those who are scholars. If you speak to an average Joe on the street and you ask them about Abu Talib, obviously, having been brainwashed by their scholars, they're only going to parrot what they've heard in the mosque and in their books. So they're going to say that Abu Talib was a disbeliever. But I wouldn't blame them. Obviously, they should put more of an effort to realize that the one who protected the Prophet and sacrificed everything he had, including his own children for Rasulullah, is not going to be a disbeliever. They would have to be complete imbeciles to believe this. That Abu Talib was after all of this still a, believe, a disbeliever and refused to believe in the Prophet. But I still don't blame them directly. I blame their scholars. So if you ask a scholar and he still says that Abu Talib was a disbeliever, you have incontrovertible truth brothers and sisters that that scholar himself is the biggest disbeliever he himself is a hypocrite and he's hell-bound as the imams i just quoted the hadith for you so let me give you just a couple of examples of people like that the first is someone who's venerated by sufis and by uh, many people who follow false Irfans. His name is very uh, relatable to many of them, and that is Muhyuddin ibn Arabi. Muhyuddin ibn Arabi, in his book, uh, Fususul Hikam, openly exhibits this hate and hostility towards Abu Talib. Listen to what he says. He says, وَلَوْ كَانَ لِلْهِمَّةِ أَثَرٌ وَلَا بُدْ He says, if desire to have something manifest in reality, if this desire had the ability to affect physical change, right? Who had a greater desire than 
our holy prophet, he says. Let me try and rephrase this. The point that they're trying to make is there is a verse in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You do not guide whoever you like, whoever you love. It is God who guides. Now what's this verse trying to say? Very clearly and in plain, unambiguous terms, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that guidance comes from God. The Prophet is what? إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرْ You are but a reminder. The Prophet reminds. The Prophet makes us reflect. The Prophet allows us to recollect. The Prophet reminds us of the blessings and bounties of God so that we could then believe in Him. But ultimately, who gives guidance? It's God Himself. That's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this verse. But look at what the Umayyads have done. They've taken this verse and they said, they said, oh, okay. The Prophet really loved his uncle. God is telling the Prophet that by, by mere virtue of the fact that you love him doesn't change anything. God is the one who guides whoever he wants. Somehow they've inserted the name of Abu Talib in the commentary of this verse, even though the verse has nothing to do with Abu Talib. Right? So, Ibn Arabi says that to desire something to happen doesn't actually make it happen, based on this concept that I just mentioned. Then he says, I'll quote the actual statement so that no one says, oh, you know, this was misunderstood or whatever. لم يكن أحد أكمل من رسول الله. No one was more perfect than the Prophet. By the way, then he says صلى الله عليه وسلم. He skips the family of the Prophet. Says may God's blessings be upon him. لا تصلوا عليه الصلاة البتراء. But we'll disregard that for a moment because it gets much much worse. He says who was more perfect than the Prophet? No one. ولا أعلى وَلَا أَقْوَى هِمَّةً مِنْهِ No one was higher in virtue than the Prophet and no one had greater desire than the Prophet himself. And yet, desire in this sense, وَمَا أَثَّرَتْ فِي إِسْلَامِ أَبِي طَالِبَ عَمِّهِ He says, and yet that desire had no effect in the Islam, in other words, in the rejection of the religion of Islam by his uncle Abu Talib. The fact that the Prophet desired so much for his uncle to become a believer, but it had no effect. Who says that? Ibn Arabi. What does that say about Ibn Arabi? I'll mention one more example. A person who is probably even more famous than Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi. Unfortunately, he's quoted very frequently by even some of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, by ignorant Shias who don't know any better, and people who have received their version of this person's literature uh, in a very polished manner, with hundreds of filters to make it look nice and presentable. They haven't really done any research, they haven't looked into him, they haven't looked into his ideas. And so they see something that sounds nice, that's attributed this, to this person, they take it, they put it out there on social media. It's very unfortunate, brothers and sisters. We should be much more discerning than that. We should be much more cautious than that. We should be much more careful to use the litmus test that's given to us by the Ahlul Bayt before we jump to conclusions. This person's name is Jalaluddin Rumi, the famous poet, right? in book number six of his Masnavi collection of poetry. He has a long poem in which he basically says, I don't want to actual, use the actual words that he uses because it's, it's so hard, so difficult for a true believer, for a Shia to even read those lines of poetry. 
which are filled with insults against God himself. He says that uh, when Abu Talib was on his deathbed, the uh, Prophet came to him and he said to him, My uncle, you've done so much for me. You've been my guardian. You've been my protector. You've been my helper. And now I ask you to give the testimony of faith, to acknowledge belief in God, to become a Muslim so that I could have something to defend you with on the Day of Judgment. So that when I try to intercede for you, I can say to God, well, he was a Muslim. But until you become a Muslim, I can't intercede for you. But Abu Talib's heart, Rumi says, was so dark. And he was filled with such arrogance that he refused to become a Muslim until he died. And then Rumi uses a term in reference to Abu Talib, which is like stabbing knives into my heart. He used the term khabis. He called Abu Talib a wicked man, which tells you who the real khabis is, brothers and sisters. The Ahlul Bayt gave us this litmus test. SubhanAllah. You reject Abu Talib knowingly. I mean, they say that Rumi was a Arif. He was an oracle of Arfan and source of gnosis and knowledge of the divine and this is his understanding this is his gnosis ibn arabi is the same now for the final part of this lecture brothers and sisters pay close attention this is important so far we've been engaging in polemics but i think we're beyond that if they want to believe in reality, they want to believe in who Abu Talib If they want to show a modicum of respect and pay back some of their debt to Abu Talib, that's per their prerogative. If they choose not to, they'll have to answer to that on the Day of Judgment. What about us? What about us? Listen to this. Amir al the commander of the faithful, used to uh, give uh, counsel and uh, advice to his children to perform the circumambulation around the Kaaba Tawaf on behalf of his father every year. He would tell his children, when you go to Umrah, when you go to Hajj, make sure you do Tawaf on behalf of my father Abu Talib. Because had it not been for Abu Talib, the Kaaba wouldn't be there. Islam wouldn't be there. The Imam is trying to emphasize this point which is why every imam after the commander of the faithful would carry out these instructions by their father Amir al muminin and they would convey these instructions to the imam after them to their children after them so much so listen to this beautiful hadith very practical as well for all of us so that we don't get confused with all of the deviant ideologies that are out there so that we don't get to the point where we're like oh you know was he a believer was he a not believer this is how the imams address this problem someone came to imam al-sadiq he said to him ya ibn rasulullah there is a man who's borrowed money from me he owes me a debt but he refuses to pay back the what he owes me i've asked him so many times he just refuses to do so and i really need the money the Imam said to him, <clears throat> he said, do you want your wishes to be granted? You want the money back? Tuf sab'an hawl al-bayt. Go and perform seven rounds of tawaf around the Kaaba on behalf of Abu Talib. Do this for Abu Talib. Because sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrates and shows the status of certain individuals by virtue of the fact that they become intermediaries and intercessors to having people's prayers answered. That's why sometimes you find a particular Imam Zada somewhere or uh, an individual who's a wali 
from among the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A scholar, a marja or something that suddenly news spreads within the community that if you need something, you should make a vow between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that should you get your prayers answered, you would you know, perhaps do something. Maybe go and uh, take some food and distribute it to the visitors of that shrine or something along those lines. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to sway the people, to nudge us to the recognition of the high status of that individual through these means. So Imam al-Sadiq told that man, you want your money back? Go perform seven rounds around the Kaaba. He said, I went and I did the seven rounds. Now this is, by the way, mind you, this is months, probably years. This person was trying to get his money back unsuccessfully. The Imam said to him, do seven rounds. He said, as soon as I finished, I was walking outside of the sacred house of Allah, the, the Masjid al-Haram. He says, I saw the person who owed me money standing by the door. As soon as I saw him, he said, where have you been? I've been looking for you. Don't you want your money back? Here, take your money. <laughs> the Imams السلام, would constantly remind us of the great status and virtue of Abu Talib through these means, as well as by speaking of his merits. Let me share this very quickly with you, if I may. Um, we all know that in the battle of Badr, there were three heroes that went towards the enemy and fought bravely. We all know the story, right? The first and greatest one of all was Ali ibn Abi Talib, the commander of the faithful. All of them, by the way, all three were members of the families, uh, the members of the Prophet's own family. The sacrifice that the Prophet and his family have made is incomprehensible. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, and Al Harith, uh, Ubaidah ibn Al Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib, an individual who unfortunately um, not many people speak about him or his merits. Number one, he was the Prophet's cousin. Number two, he was the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, just like the Prophet. But his father was Al Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib, one of the uncles of the Prophet. His name was Al Harith. So his son's name was Ubaidah. Remember this name, brothers and sisters. Ubaidah ibn al Harith was firstly the Prophet's cousin. Secondly, he was the oldest person in the Battle of Badr. He was 63 years of age. Number three, he was injured and eventually was martyred and became the first martyr from the family of Rasulullah. When I mention his name, I say, Salamullahi ala Ubaidah ibn al Harith. So these three people, they went forward, they fought, and famously, Hamza killed Utbah, the father of Hind, who's the wife of Abu Sufyan. Long story short, Ubaidah ibn al-Harith gets injured. His leg is cut off by Shayba, who was his opponent, who was killed by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. So uh, Ubaidah ibn al-Harith is then dragged back, he, br he was brought back to the Prophet by Imam Ali and Hamza, his uncle. When they took him to the Prophet, listen to this, نَظَرَ إِلَيْهِ رَسُولُ الله. The Prophet looked at him, فَاسْتَعْبَرْ The Prophet choked up with sadness and started crying. فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Ubaidah said to him, O Messenger of God, بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي May my parents be ransomed for you. Alastu shahidan. Tell me, am I not a martyr? The Prophet said to him, Bala anta awwalu shahidin min ahli bayti. Yes, you are the first martyr from my family. Faqal. Then Harith, uh, Ubaidah said to the Prophet, He said, Ama law kana ammuka hayyun la'alima anni awla bima qala minh. He said, If my uncle and your uncle meaning Abu Talib, if he was alive, he would be proud of what I have done. The Prophet said to him, which uncle? He said, Abu Talib. Abu Talib used to always say this, Ubaidah says, كَذِبْتُمْ وَبَيْتِ اللَّهِ mentions a, uh, some poetry 
in which he says that we will stand by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We will defend him to our last breath. We will protect him no matter the cost. And so Ubaidah said to the Prophet, I wish your uncle Abu Talib was around so he could see what I have done. Meaning brothers and sisters that all members of the family of Rasulullah, they were inspired by Abu Talib. Abu Talib had cast his incredible glorious shadow on everyone in the family of Rasulullah. Everyone looked up to him as the epitome of devotion and sacrifice for the sake of Rasulullah. So after he said this, the Prophet said to him, قَالْ أَمَا تَرَى إِبْنَهُ كَلَّيْثِ الْعَادِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَابْنُهُ الْآخَرِ فِي جِهَادِ اللَّهِ بِأَرْضِ الْحَبَشَةِ He said to him, Abu Talib is here with us. You have his son Ali ibn Abi Talib right here. You have his other son, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib also in Habasha. And the point here being, brothers and sisters, that Abu Talib, made such a sacrifice for the Prophet of Islam, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, that that sense of sacrifice was then translated into Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen was the person willing to die for Rasulullah at any point. And part of it, of course, Amir al-Mu'mineen is the commander of the faithful. Of course, he's the gate to the to the city of knowledge that is the Prophet. Of course, he's inspired by Rasulullah himself, but part of it was the genes of Abu Talib. Part of this spirit of sacrifice was inherited from his father Abu Talib. In fact, brothers and sisters, that spirit which Abu Talib inspired into his family and especially his children and his descendants, is nowhere seen better than obviously after Amir al-Mu'mineen than in Karbala. Because the entire lineage of uh, Aqil, the, the, prophet's, uh, the prophet's uncle, right? Uh, Aqil, his son was who? Muslim ibn Aqil. But he also had other brothers and Muslim had children. Historians say that the lineage of Aqil was severed on the day of Ashura. Every single member of his family, his offspring, were killed on the plains of Karbala. Where did they get this from? They got it from Abu Talib. The fact that many of you might not know this, we all are familiar with the story of Amir al-Mu'mineen sleeping in the bed of the Prophet on the day of Mabit, and the you know extremely famous story that no one can deny. But did you know that it was Abu Talib who came to Ali ibn Abi Talib, his son, and told him to go and spend the night in the Prophet's bed while the Prophet fled from Medina? It was Abu Talib who asked him to do that. And of course, Ali ibn Abi Talib didn't even need any encouragement. But it was Abu Talib who did this. Finally, my brothers and sisters, let me conclude with this beautiful hadith. When Abu Talib died, as Shaykh al Mufid says, لما قبض أبو طالب رحمه الله أتى أمير المؤمنين رسول الله. The commander of the faithful came to deliver the news to the messenger of God. He told him that his uncle had died. فتوجع لذلك النبي. The Prophet felt an excruciating pain for that news. Then he told him, امضي يا علي فتولى غسله وتكفينه وتحنيطه Oh Ali, go back and prepare your father for burial. I want you and no one else to bathe the body, to enshroud the body, to prepare it for burial. فإذا رفعته على سريره فأعلمني Then when you place him on the casket, come and tell me. فَفَعَلَ ذَلِكَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The Imam did exactly as told. فَلَمَّا رَفَعَهُ عَلَى السَّرِيرِ اعْتَرَضَهُ النَّبِي The Prophet then came. فَرَقَّ لَهُ The Prophet, his heart was, was broken. He started crying. 
He then looked at Abu Talib. He said to him, وَصَلْتَ رَحِمًا وَجُزِيتَ خَيْرًا فَقَدْ رَبَّيْتَ وَكَفَّلْتَ صَغِيرًا He said, you, you provided to me when I was a child. You looked after me. May Allah reward you for that. وَآزَرْتَ وَنَصَرْتَ كَبِيرًا As a child, you protected me. As an adult, you accompanied me. You supported me. ثُمَّ أَقْبَلَ عَلَى النَّاسِ Then the Prophet looked at all the people around him. فَقَالْ أَمَا وَاللَّهِ Verily, in the, in the name of God Himself, I swear to God, لَأَشْفَعَنَّ لِعَمِّي شَفَاعَةً I shall provide an intercession for my uncle, يَعْجَبُ مِنْهَا أَهْلُ الثَّقَلَيْنِ An intercession that will make every member of God's creatures, the jinn and the ins, be in awe of this intercession. Be amazed at this intercession. Now I thought about this. What does it mean when the Prophet says that people will be amazed? I think on the one hand, they'll be amazed because the vast majority of Muslims fail to recognize Abu Talib. And so on the day of judgment, their jaws will drop. They'll finally come to realize what they should have known all along. And then for the rest of us, even us believers, even we don't know the gravity of Abu Talib. Even we cannot fathom the greatness of Abu Talib. The fact that he had the inheritance of prophets in his possessions. The fact, the fact that he was not just a believer, but a successor to all of God's long line of prophetic messengers and apostles inspired by God himself. Abu Talib even makes references to what I'm just saying in many parts of his life, along many turning points. For example, when he went to ask the hand of Khadija bint Khuwaylid for his nephew, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, who you all remember, he was only 25 years at the time. He wasn't uh, inspired to be a messenger of God. And yet when Abu Talib went to ask her hand in marriage for his nephew, he gave this long, beautiful, articulate sermon about the merits and virtues of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And eventually he said, soon enough, you shall see how he receives revelation from God. <laughs> Soon enough. Sallallahu alayka ya mawla ya Abu Talib. Sallallahu alayka ya Sayyidi. Ya Sayyid al-Badha. Sallallahu alayka ya mawla. Ya Abu al-A'imma. May Allah bless you all brothers and sisters. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Talib.